Hello and um, welcome to this webinar. My name's David and um, hopefully you can see my screen okay. Um, if you can also just let me know that the microphone's working fine, you're hearing me fine, it looks like it's coming through. Um, so yeah, you can write that in the question section or not. I'll just give everyone a couple of seconds just to get ready and then we'll, um, we'll press on um, with the presentation itself. Okay, cheers. Thanks, that guys. I can see you can hear me. Okay, so we'll go through this. Um, so the webinar is scheduled to run for an hour. It should be a little bit shorter than that. Um, it should be something in the order of maybe 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, first off, I'll run through some slides that I've prepared talking about the DAX, and we'll talk about the fundamentals behind it and things that are driving the DAX and things to watch out for. And then after that, we'll um, go to the X Station platform and then we'll um, start looking through um, some actual the live market and see what's going on. And also look at a few individual stocks. The individual stocks are closed. The DAX itself trades from eight in the morning until 4.30, the individual stocks on the stock market. But we also have the D30 and the D30 cash markets, which trade longer hours than that. Um, on our platform. So individual stocks will close in that time, but the other ones um, should be okay. So before we go any further, just a quick uh, disclaimer. Um, this is basically just to say this presentation should be taken as general information and marketing purposes. It shouldn't be construed as investment advice. Um, like I said, I'll be talking about things I believe drive the DAX, uh, things to watch out for, um, important fundamental and technical things. But at the end of the day, whenever you're trading, it should really come down to your decision. So um, by all means, hopefully take on board whatever I do say, but don't um, believe this to be uh, investment advice. I won't be saying something, for instance, like to go out and buy the DAX or to sell the DAX now. Um, okay, so just a quick overview of what we've talked through um, in this slideshow. There's uh, five uh, main points, really, that I want to discuss. So first, we'll look at where we are at present. So what's happened recently in the DAX, what's happened um, previously. We'll look at the latest German economic data. Now, this is obviously very important. How the German economy is doing is one of the key drivers of the stock market performance there, as well as the global economy. And I'll touch on that a bit more. We'll look at monetary policy, so that's um, basically what we see from the ECB at present and their uh, stance there. And we'll also talk about the possibility of fiscal policy. This has become a bigger theme in recent months and the possibility that we get some fiscal stimulus from Germany. Uh, by that, I mean increased government spending. And this would obviously be seen as positive for the stock market. So that is another possible uh, driver to keep on the horizon. Uh, seasonality is also a good thing to look at. Um, how you get certain patterns, you have certain periods of weakness typically um, over the past uh, 10, 20 years in stock markets and then you also have certain periods where they're stronger. Uh, the summer, for instance, is typically seen as a little bit weak and you have heightened volatility. We saw that in the DAX where we got quite a strong sell-off at the start of August. But as we've come back um, out of the summer into the autumn, uh, throughout September and particularly October, we've seen a strong push higher in the market. Uh, just earlier today, actually hit its highest level in 16 months. So it's a good time to be doing this webinar, hopefully, and um, lots of exciting opportunities to keep an eye out for. Um, okay, so this is a comparison chart against uh, six major stock benchmarks. Uh, we've got the DAX listed at the top here. You can see it's up 20 uh, percent on the year, a little bit less than the S&P 500. That's the SPX, uh, the NASDAQ. Below that is the best performer, uh, up by about 30% on the year. Then we've got the French CAC, which is 23%, uh, the Japanese Nikkei, or 14%, and the uh, Hang Seng Index um, in Hong Kong, which is seen as a proxy on China. That's up by about 6%. If you look at the third, third column along where we've got digits here, the difference, uh, this is using the SP500 as a base and then showing each index relative to that. So you can see the DAX has underperformed it a little bit, but not too bad by around 3%. NASDAQ's been the star performer. Um, and then we're getting uh, quite lagging really in Asia with the Hang Seng and also the Nikkei falling behind. It's also worth noting that US indices this week, uh, just yesterday, hit new all time highs. So we saw both the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. So that's the US 500 and US 100 on X station move up into uncharted territory. But we have seen a little bit of weakness uh, this afternoon. And there's once more been some talk about uh, this possible trade deal between the US and China not going through quite as smoothly as everyone has been hoping. And because of that, we've seen a bit of selling back. Um, just to kind of look, and this leads back in bit into the seasonality point I was making a moment ago. 
If you look at the DAX here, this is the white line. You can see we got to a very strong start to the year. If you remember, the last quarter of 2018 was quite troublesome for the market. But since then, we have um, had a very strong start. It leveled off. And throughout the summer, as I was saying, which is typically a weaker period for stocks, we did get increased volatility, a strong sell off at the end of July, start of August. But the past couple of months, we've really started to push higher again, hit the highest level of the year around two weeks ago. And we've made several new higher highs in the index since then. So you can see where we sit in the DAX, just over 20 percent is um, below the NASDAQ, which is a standout form in the S&P 500, but around mid range compared to these other markets. Now, I just want to give you a rough idea of how you can look within the index. So the DAX has 30 companies on it, um, all listed here. And you can see at the time the screenshot was taken, which I think was just after three o'clock, uh, the index broadly was little changed. It was up 0.17%. But if you look underneath the surface, there's lots going on with the individual stocks. And you can trade these individual stocks um, with us at XDB as well, like I say, up until 4.30 when the cash market closes. So you can see we had strong gains here, 1.85%, 1.8%. Um, several stocks are up over 1.5% on the day. And we also had a few decent sized decline is Adidas, which actually been one of the star performers so far this year, um, was down quite quite heavily, 2.8%. Um, and then we've also got Covestro and Daimler, which are also moving lower. Um, so it's just an uh, interesting thing to look at. And sometimes looking at what individual stocks are doing can give you a better idea of the overall index. Um, on that, so this is each individual stock. So all those stocks I just talked about there, all 30 of them, and their year-to-date returns. You can see Adidas was, um, this doesn't include today's price movements actually, so it was the best performing stock, um, just above MTU Aero Engines, which is MTX as a ticker. Um, because that was higher today and Adidas dropped, this may have changed, but you get the idea. These have both had very strong, impressive performances this year, up over 50%. We've got several other stocks which have had 30% plus gains. And if we just cast our mind back a couple of minutes ago to 20% um, where the broader index is high, you can see there's a good chunk of stocks that have actually outperformed the broader index. And we've had a, also quite a few stocks that have underperformed them. Down at the bottom end, uh, the worst performer, quite standout really, is Lufthansa. Um, and the airline struggled really with what we've seen as um, general problems um, in the sector. Um, amongst airlines this year with several um, uh, airlines struggling, uh, going out of business, etc. And it's been quite hard for the travel uh, industry. So you can see Lufthansa is by far the worst performing stock. Uh, Wirecard down over 10%. But other than that, everything else is pretty much flat or slightly higher on the day. Um, if anyone does have any questions as we go through this, um, please feel free to um, ask a question on the question box and um, there will be time to ask a question at the end also and I'll also provide my email um, address at the end so if you want if you think of anything later or you, it's a bit longer question please feel free to email across. Now one of the key themes um, in terms of the German economy um, that I've been following and I think a lot of other traders investors have been following is um, the growth has clearly slowed in Germany so for the second quarter of the year, we had a negative reading of 0.1% for GDP. You can see we had one at the back end of 2018 as well. And we've not yet got the third quarter figures, but there is a chance that we get another negative reading here and two successive negative readings um, fulfills what is generally seen as the um, definition of a technical recession. So there is a chance that Germany could actually be falling into a recession, albeit a mild and shallow one, it looks like at the moment. But despite that, we've seen quite a strong move higher in the stocks throughout the year. Now, one of the big um, weights on the German economy has been a negative um, external demand. So you've basically seen exports falling faster than imports. And Germany is seen by some as a kind of um, global bellwether because you have big automobile manufacturers um, in the DAX as well. So BMW, uh, Daimler, Volkswagen, and you also have um, airlines and the like as well. So it's seen by some as a sort of proxy on how the global economy is doing. Um, just to take a long-term view of um, German GDP, it's average 0.5% quarter on quarter um, from 1970. So that's obviously prior to reunification, but you can calculate what the data would have been if it was reunified back then up until 2019 
Uh, the fastest pace of growth was 4% in early 1970, and the slowest was uh, minus 4.7% in a quarter in 2009 at the height of that financial crisis. Now, whilst the GDP data is interesting and it's probably the most widely followed gauge of economic activity, it's quite lagging in its nature. As I say, we've still not even got the figures for the third quarter yet, even though that ended just over a month ago. Um, so what a lot of trade investors look to is PMI readings. So PMI stands for Purchasing Managers Index, and it's simply a survey amongst purchasing managers at several companies, and they basically fill out a questionnaire um, of several points, how they see the economy. Um, and the idea is the people that make the purchasing decisions for businesses are normally at the cutting edge. So they're the first people to realize when things are slowing down, they'll cut back on the purchases. If things are picking up, they'll be one of the first to get aggressive and to increase those purchases. So um, manufacturing is seen as the most important as far as Germany is concerned. And this is a chart here going back to 2000. You've got the German manufacturing PMI, this red line. And what you can see is we've had pretty atrocious figures. Um, for the past year or so it's actually dropped to its lowest level just last month so that was last month's release so in september the data fell to its lowest level in 10 years there was a tiny increase in october but i think the last reading was around 42.3 42.4 something like that um which is far worse than anything we saw during the eurozone debt crisis around 2012 2013 and like i say you have to go back to that global financial crisis 2008 2009 to find lower levels so manufacturing in germany has been struggling for some time it has been um under pressure but there is some hope that possibly this is turning higher and um i'll show you i think it's the next slide it's the slide after the next one i'll come to with some data we had out just this morning on factory orders where we saw quite a big improvement um this slowdown in pmis isn't just something that's confined to eurozone we've seen it um, all around the globe. We've seen it in the US, particularly in the Far East as well, in part due to these trade tensions that we've had between the US and China. So you can see global PMIs um, have been in decline. You can see this one here. If you exclude the US, um, this was where the weakness first became evident, but the US has also slowed significantly uh, lately. And this is a composite PMI. So the two main ones you look at are manufacturing services and um, basically, you can weight the manufacturing, the services by their proportionate size in the economy, and that would give you an uh, overall view of what the PMIs are. The services are holding up better than the manufacturing, but they're still not really strong. So you can see we've fallen back down to around this 50 mark. If I just go back a slide as well, a key point to make about the PMIs that I'm not sure if people are aware of is this 50 line here is seen as the key line in the sand. So if you're above 50, that signals expansion and rising. If it's below 50, that's contraction territory. And you can see we've been below 50, particularly in Germany, for quite some time. And we are down towards those lowest levels, as I said, we've seen in around a decade. Um, just this morning, though, there has been uh, some positive data out of Germany. And overall, we've seen better than expected data from the US and also Asia in the past month or so. Uh, German factory orders obviously feeds in quite closely to the manufacturing figures. And you can see it's the first time in a year that we've actually had positive growth in factory orders um, in total, which was I think 1.3% month on month. Um, and we've also had um, all aspects of that improving. So domestic factory orders, foreign factory orders, and also non-euro area orders. So you can see this is actually quite strong. Whilst we did have big pickups in other parts um, a few months ago, we didn't have the domestic increasing, et cetera. And you have to go back quite a top while till we got all of these in synchrony moving higher. Um, one of the reasons, or probably the chief reason, I'd say why the stock market's done so well, despite the economy being pretty weak, is a um, uh, global shift that we've seen to easier monetary policy. So the ECB, which controlled the uh, interest rates and monetary policy all throughout the Eurozone, um, have basically announced that they were going to provide another stimulus package at their September meeting, and they cut the deposit rate further uh, by 0.1% to a new all-time low of uh, minus 0.5%, so it went further into negative territory. And they also announced the resumption of their asset purchase program, which is known in other countries, uh, the UK and US as quantitative easing, um, which will start this month, uh, November, and that will begin at a pace of 20 billion euros um, worth of bonds per month. 
Um, these measures were first introduced back in 2015 when rates got put into negative territory for the first time and uh, asset purchase program was started and this basically has the effect of stimulating the economy. It's seen as an aim to try and drive inflation but also what it does in effect is it does boost asset prices because um, it means the cost of borrowing is far cheaper and um, there's a big deterrent away from saving if you get a negative interest rate and therefore if you look at the relative attract um, relative attraction on say stocks compared to a savings account stocks with a dividend of five or six percent are seen even more positive and even more favorable compared to savings particularly if you're getting a negative rate um, so this is the um, overnight deposit rate of the ECB going back to the late 90s when the uh, central bank was founded. You can see generally there's been a um, gradual trend lower. Um, we moved down into negative territory as I say back in 2015. It's a few steps down, normally moves in 10 basis point drops and since then we were on hold um, for the best part of two and a half years before there was another drop at that meeting in September. So there is really very strong and almost unprecedented amounts of um, monetary stimulus the ECB are trying to use to improve the Eurozone economy and obviously that has boosted um, the German stock market and amongst other things. Um, this is a chart of um, monthly asset purchases from the ECB. As you can see on the right hand side this is a scale in uh, billions. You can see it started um, late 2014 really took off throughout 2015 um, at a pace of up to 60 billion a month. Um, this was the target of 60 billion a month, we had a few months above, a few months below. It was ramped up to 80 billion um, in the middle of 2016 when uh, um, ECB decided that they needed further stimulus and you can see after that they gradually tapered this off and reduced it to um, back to its lowest level um, in several years at the back end of last year. Um, I think this three here is simply just the reinvestment of bonds as they mature. Obviously when you buy bonds they do have an expiry date and once they expire um, the bank will reinvest the money they get back from the bond back into the program. So that's a lower pace of bond buying but it is still a small buying um, of bonds. Now one of the problems um, that people who follow this and this methodology for why it's uh, been propping up stock markets so well for the best part of the last decade is that there's an idea that bond buying is approaching its limits. So you can see here there's something called the capital key uh, in the Eurozone and what this means is there's only certain bonds that are eligible to be purchased by the ECB and what you can see here is there's an ECB self-imposed limit at the moment where they won't own more than a third of any country's government debt. Um, you can see we're getting quite close to those levels in Netherlands and Germany um, because these are deemed as the most credit worthy. So that's normally where the ECB first look to buy bonds. They want to hold a larger portion of bonds from these countries. But the problem that you may face with this going over time, particularly now the asset purchases have resumed, is that they're running out of bonds they can effectively buy. So unless they change the rules and move this limit higher, there may be a limit to how many more uh, bonds they can purchase. Um, on that you can see total bonds that would be eligible for QE purchases um, and you can see what their ECB holdings are. So you can see for instance at the moment the ECB holdings are um, largest France and Italy. Now this is total holdings not a holding as a percentage of that country's debt and you can see that these are the sort of areas where they would look to increase those purchases if they want to. Um, you can see the bonds which they look at are 1 to 30 in maturity. Um, they include inflation linked bonds and nominal bonds. So France and Italy do offer the most room for further bond buying but there is a chance that you start to get up to that portion where you own um, over a third of the government's debt and therefore you could run into problems in terms of um, the capital key requirements. So that leads us on to fiscal policy. So there's two main ways you can stimulate an economy. Monetary policy, which is simply controlling interest rates or printing money, and then fiscal policy, which is government spending and taxation. So if you want to provide fiscal stimulus, you can either increase government spending or reduce taxes. And um, there's been growing calls from several people, um, none more so really than the outgoing ECB president, Mario Draghi, to uh, basically 
um, move away from re this reliance on monetary policy and try and get some fiscal policy to pick up some of the slack. Um, this is uh, Germany's budget balance as a percentage of GDP. And what you can see is this is at its highest level um, that it's been in many years. Um, I think the next chart actually goes back even further to the mid 90s. You can see that around this time, the budget as a percentage of GDP was a deficit of around 9%. But you can see we've had a surplus for quite some time now. And what the surplus means is that the government is essentially bringing in more in taxation than they're spending. Um, this is seen as good for government finances, but it's not providing much uh, stimulation to the economy. If anything, it's slowing the economy down and trying to not run it so fast. So um, in 2018, I think the surplus widened to a record of 59.2 billion, um, which was around 1.7% of GDP. Uh, sorry, I'll just go back a slide, probably show that easier. Uh, yeah, here, so you can see um, it hit for a record of 1.7% of GDP um, before dipping off. And basically, um, this was the fifth year in a row that there'd been a government surplus. Um, over time, uh, going back to 1995, which as far as I could get the data back, on average, the government has had a budget deficit of 1.78%. So that's minus 1.78%. So somewhere just around these levels here. And throughout that time, if you take that as the base level, you can see now where we're at is quite a high, um, quite a high high figure really. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is market positioning. Now this is a chart um, which I got from my colleague in Poland which shows the implied volatility of options on the DAX and the DAX values. So on the left here is the implied volatility which is uh, traced by these blue uh, lines and on the right is the DAX axis inverted so it runs from low at the top to high at the bottom and then this grey um, shows the DAX. What you can see simply here is typically when implied volatility falls, it seems positive for the stock market. So if we look here around 2015, when the ECB were announced those stimulus measures, we had declining implied volatility and we got a rallying stock market. Um, on the other hand, when you get implied volatility spiking sharply higher, such as this period, uh, 2018, around uh, March or April of last year, uh, you got the DAX falling back low. You can see this is when the DAX um, at its all-time high, and then it actually pulled back to around the 12,000 level. One thing to look to, and it's what we've kind of had now, is this divergence between implied volatility and the DAX. For instance, here, you can see when implied volatility dropped sharply, but the DAX was still staying around this 10,500 level, this was suggesting that the DAX was possibly uh, not reflecting the... Um, implied volatility seen in the options market and therefore was due to catch up. You can see it subsequently went on a strong rally. Now we may be getting the opposite happening where implied volatility is remaining fairly high, even though it is towards its lower reaches, but the DAX is actually looking to get ahead of that. So it could be getting a little bit ahead of itself. And we've seen a strong run higher, I think in the past month or so, we've had um, gains of um, six, seven percent, something like that. So we have seen a lot of upside and there is um, some concern that maybe we've run too far. We'll look at some technical levels in a moment um, when we go over to X station. Uh, just before we do that, the last thing I want to talk about um, on this is um, seasonality. Um, so this is each month of the year across the top. We've got the highest monthly performance in the last 10 years. So the best January in the last 10 years so on a 9.5% rally. We've got that average return is for that month over the past 10 years. And we've also got the low, so the worst performance that we saw um, over the last 10 years. So you can see on average, the DAX is up nine out of 12 months. Uh, January, June, and August are the only ones which are negative. And you can see that um, that links back to what I was saying earlier about it's not unusual to have some sort of volatility around the sort of summer months. And if you actually look at the present year, 2019, which we've got at the bottom here, you can see we've had three months down so far. Um, May was down 5%, by far the worst month, but then July and August where we got that volatility and downside. But since then, we've pushed higher, 4% up in September, 3.5% October, and we're already at 1.65%. Um, in November, um, just six just six days in. 
Um, okay, so before we go on to the um, technical aspect and we look at the actual charts um, as they are at the moment, uh, that's my email address. So if anyone does have any more questions on that or they want um, a copy of the slideshow or anything, please let me know and I can uh, email it over to you. Um, so moving on to the platform here. So this is on XStation. This is our own um, web-based browser and a proprietary trading platform. And what we've got here is a DAX chart on the monthly time frame. So obviously this is very long term. Even long-term investors probably won't look at this too much, going all the way back to 1970. But what I want to show you is basically we've had a strong move higher in general over the last 50 years. Um, unsurprisingly, stock markets have rallied over over time, and you can see again this goes back to pre um, reunification dates uh, between East and West Germany, um, where it's approximated what a combined stock market would be trading. I think the DAX itself was only actually created in the early 90s. Um, but you can see since then, the 90s were very good. We made the high around the dot-com bubble, um, around 8,000, had the sell-off very sharply, um, 2001, 2002. Moved back up, made a nice double top uh, with those just for the global financial crisis. Then we got another drop, but we didn't take out these previous layers. You can see since then, that past 10 years, when we've seen uh, central banks uh, cutting rates, and we've also seen the global economy recover from this financial crisis. Um, there's been a very strong move higher. You can see the market was trading around 3,660. And when, when I actually first started trading was around this point, uh, 2011, and we were trading below 5,000. And you can see since then we've had obviously well over 100% gains, and we are now pushing back up towards those levels on the highs. Um, so that's just to give you a very big picture overview. If we look at a more sort of practical level, um, we look back to the all-time high, which is uh, 13,595, which was made here uh, end of January last year, 2018. You can see after that, we got a pullback, another push higher. Throughout a lot of 2018, particularly the second half, it's quite a tough time for investors. Stock markets in general are moving lower. But they bottomed out just around the turn of the year. I think the low actually came on Boxing Day for several markets that were open. And then the start of this year, we had a strong move higher, as I saw um, at our very first chart talking about the DAX and global equities. We had a range bound trade, but we have pushed up higher. In the last few weeks, we've made a strong push to the upside. So we're now back near this 13,200 level, which coincides with this double top from here. And this is a potential resistance area that I've got my eye on um, going forward. You can see after this strong move higher, which isn't too um, unusual, if we just zoom in, we have found a bit of resistance. I think today, actually, when we hit that highest level uh, since that double top back in June of 2018, we did just about breached 13,200, made a high of 13,204, but we have since sold back, uh, partly due to that Chinese news as well. Um, so this is an area to look, keep an eye on and see how we trade. If we do make a clean break above here, then there's obviously potential for further gains. You could see another attempt at these all-time highs of um, 13,595. But if we do fail here, then there is quite a lot of space um, to move to the downside where we've seen an advance of, um, what's that, 550 uh, ticks just in the past couple of weeks. Um, if you are looking to see if the market's overbought or oversold, people normally use oscillators. Um, the favorite one I turn to is a uh, relative strength index or RSI. You can see on the RSI, we have got fairly high readings at present. Um, 76, I think that was a little bit higher earlier, 76.9 it was. But um, 76 is above 70. So you can look on the right hand side here. Normally you say anything above 70 is overbought. Anything below 30 is uh, oversold. If it goes above 80, it's extremely overbought. Below 20, it's extremely oversold. But it's worth noting that just because the market's overbought doesn't mean it can't keep going higher. Just because the market's oversold doesn't mean it can't keep going lower. If we look back here, for instance, uh, during those declines last year, the market got down to this RSI reading of 25.3. We did see a bounce, but then we had another push lower. And actually, by the time we dropped down lower, the RSI had recovered because there was less downward momentum around those lows when we did make them. So um, that's something which you can look at. So in terms of RSI, we are in overbought territory, but not extremely overbought. It's not like the market's run 
way too far, way too fast, and it looks really stretched. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on there. Um, another thing to look at, whilst we are broadly in a range, we have been for the past, let's say 20, 22 months, and there has been a few clear trends within that. Now, my favorite way of trying to identify a trend is using Ichimoku clouds. So if we put on Ichimoku cloud here, um, you can see how this works. So what you basically first look for is price to drop down below the cloud. So if we just go to this point here, focus your attention on the left of the screen, you can see the market drop down below the cloud, which is a signal of a possible trend change. However, this trend change isn't confirmed until you have three more things happening. So you need these two lines here, um, which are, um, I call the leading line and the signal line. And once those come down below the cloud, that's further confirmation. They normally move fairly similarly. They are moving averages themselves. Um, I think nine and 26 periods, they're not hugely different. Um, but the final thing which you need is actually for the uh, lagging line to come through as well. So you can see, probably easiest if we look at the present price to see the lagging line, because obviously the lagging line is uh, several periods behind. Uh, this lagging line is 26 periods behind the current price. And what you can see is when the price first broke down here, you see the lagging line was still in the cloud. And whilst we were pushing back up here, the lagging line was still above the cloud. And it wasn't until we got to around this point here, <clears throat> this point here, we saw the lagging line move underneath the cloud. And this would have been a really nice selling opportunity because we've got lagging line below the cloud, price below the cloud, and both the leading and signal line below the cloud. So that's a nice setup where everything's pointing lower and lo and behold, we've got the strong move to a downside. Um, since then, when the trend changed, you can see again, we broke up first, price went through the cloud, pulled back, we then got these two, uh, the leading and signal line coming through the cloud, but the lagging line was still not up through the cloud, so you don't have full confirmation. You didn't actually get full confirmation until here <clears throat> that uh, the trend had changed and gone higher. So. Obviously, if you trade this as soon as price goes through the cloud, you often get a better entry, but there's a greater chance you'll be wrong. It's a riskier trade because you're entering sooner. And what you're basically doing is having a trade off where you're giving up some of the certainty that the trend has changed for a better price. So that's something to keep an eye on. Um, you can see here we turned lower. It wasn't much for downtrend, but it still captured it um, fairly well. Um, once we drop down here, you can see the lagging line and we did drop. Whilst it doesn't look a lot, that's still 600 points from here to the lows. Um, but after we move back above it here, we we're in quite an unusual position where almost as soon as price broke, uh, the lagging line was also above the cloud, but it took a while for these leading and signal lines to come up through. You can see it wasn't till here that we had this coming up. And you don't always need to trade this as soon as you get the confirmation. So from this point, you had a confirmed uptrend, but if you think, I don't want to buy this after the market's rallied strongly in the past few weeks. You can wait for a better price, still safe and annoyed yourself that you see it as an uptrend. You could wait for buy signals to be put into the cloud. And this hammer here on the daily was a lovely signal itself, actually. And you got another hammer following it would have provided nice buy signals uh, for stop loss below the cloud or below the swing low. So around 11,800. And you can see since then we've been an uptrend. We've continued to push higher. Um, just picking out a few individual stocks, if you remember Adidas catches your attention, um, it was the best performing stock um, on the whole uh, DAX 30 up until today I think and you can see from today's daily candle there's been a sharp move lower um, and it was also the worst performing stock uh, today, I think it was down 2.5% with memory serves, something like that, 2.7%. Now as I said this had gained 50% year to date. Um, so once we had these lows around 178, you can see you get very nice trends sometimes with stocks. Um, and this was a very clear, nice uptrend. We had the pullback and since then we've just kind of been holding here. And the question now is whether this is a topping out pattern and we turn back down lower, or whether it's simply a consolidation before we go to the upside. So you can see these lows that I have marked on here around 265, possible area to look for. Um, for potential support, but you can also obviously utilize the Ichimoku here as well. If you put on the Ichimoku cloud, you can see, so going back to the start of the year when the uptrend began, you can see we pushed up through the cloud, pulled back into it nicely. We got the confirmation from all the lines and we had a very nice bull run higher. Now price has dropped back down below the cloud, which has been quite rare this year. Um, 
but we've not quite got the confirmation yet. So if we just zoom in, hopefully we can make this out. The lagging line has just today um, closed below the cloud. So that's further confirmation that we've turned lower. You can see these two lines here, the lead and the signal are still above. So you'd want to see those drop down below the cloud and the lagging line remain below the cloud along with price to confirm this downtrend, which should happen in uh, just a few days if we do see further selling and drop down below that 265 area. Uh, the second best performer, and it looks quite a lot like Adidas, um, is um, here MTX is the ticker MTX.DE, which is MTU Aero Engines. And you can see again, we've had very nice uptrend, not quite had that weakness that we've seen in the DAX in the past day or two, but you can see quite clear resistance around 256 when we made the high, got a rejection, another attempt and a firm rejection. Uh, but today we're seeing more positive price action. We've got a kind of bullish engulfing candle there. You can take support from this recent low, um, just seen a couple of weeks ago, which broadly coincides with these highs from back in the summer, around 227 as a possible area to look to. And you can also, if you stick on an Ichimoku cloud, um, see that move up higher here obviously it was captured nicely by the Ichimoku cloud now this is where you would have got a burn if you tried to be too um, quick with your entry price dropped down below here but you can see these lines didn't confirm this break in particular the lagging line hadn't come below so this was a false break lower once moved back above we got the confirmation that it's resumed an uptrend and you can see now Whilst we do have this lead and signal line quite close to breaking below the cloud, the lagging line is actually some way off it. So we'd need to either wait a bit of time for the lagging line to come into here where it could fall below or have quite a strong drop in price because the lagging line is simply the current price or the closing price projected back 26 periods, which obviously in this case is 26 days. Uh, the shape of the cloud can be quite nice to keep an eye on as well. It's nice when you get horizontal bottoms like this because obviously it's easier um, if the market makes a clean break free. Um, so this is something to look for. So if we do get a rejection in the next day or two and we fall down here, then the market could be turning lower. But for the time being, this uptrend does look like it remains intact. And if we can get out above the cloud to the upside again, then we could have another tilt of those highs around 256 and possibly even further gains going into the end of the year. Uh, just to kind of show the opposite, I so said the worst form is Lufthansa. And um, you can see this stock here has been in decline for most of the year. It has perked up and improved a little bit in recent months, but after hitting a high of 23.67, the market fell quite strongly uh, down to 12.56. So not quite a 50% drop, but it was down by um, around 40%, let's say, off those highs. Why the reason the year-to-date gains aren't so um, bad is because where we started the year, was actually fairly low down coming off the back of uh, last year. So you can see here, we started the year um, around the 19 mark. So actually it's only lost um, not so much really in terms of uh, year to date uh, because we started low. But after that rally from peak to trough, it's actually been quite a big decline. And finally, if we just put the Ichimoku cloud on, you can see here again, once we turned lower, this would have been a warning sign when price dropped below, um, but it took a while for the lagging line. You can see it just clung onto the cloud there, and we've got the lead and the signal line come through. But when we got this drop down here, um, it was set up quite nicely, really, and then we got quite aggressive selling to the downside. One thing to look out for with stocks, as I was saying at the start, is they trade shorter hours than their broader index. Um, so when they trade during the cash hours from 8 o'clock to 4.30, you often get news for stocks that occur outside of those hours, such as earnings reports. So these gaps lower here may have been disappointing earnings reports uh, back in May um, or June, or you may just get other adverse news, you know, something that's uh, not good for the industry. The pleasing thing for Lufthansa here from a technical perspective is not only have we come off those lows and recovered quite nicely, um, we have now got a confirmed break back above the cloud. So um, it looks like there could be a changing trend in play here. And then what you can look at now is as long as the market and these lines remain above this cloud, then possible um, retracement and recouping of those losses and moving back higher. You'll also notice, I'm just trying to show you, uh, the cloud does get projected out into the future. So you can see the shape of the cloud 
and as you'd like in a rising trend, the cloud will come up behind you. So if you have stop losses and you think moving below the cloud would stop me out of this trade, you can squeeze those stop losses in as the trade progresses. And if this continues to go higher, this cloud will continue to go higher and you can squeeze it in. Uh, much the same way that when we're in this downtrend here, you can see the cloud was falling down lower. So if you're saying I'm going to hold this till it goes back into the cloud or even goes above the cloud, you'd had stop losses up here, but you could move those stops in sequentially over the course of days, weeks and months. And then somewhere around here, you could have chosen to exit or you could exit here when it actually came out through the cloud itself. Um, that's everything really that I've uh, got prepared to talk about. If anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to ask. Um, please feel free to ask now. Or as I say, you can uh, drop me an email um, at david.cheatham at xtp.com. Okay, so I'll just give you a few more seconds in case there is any questions, otherwise we'll wrap this up. Will it be possible to have a recorded version? Um, yeah, sure. Um, this I've recorded this whole webinar, um, so the recorded version will be available and it'll be sent out to you. If you do want it, I think it will be scheduled to be sent out tomorrow. But just to be sure, if you drop me an email um, and just ask again for it, then I'll make sure I reply to you and I can attach then the recording to it. Um. <clears throat> Okay, thanks, Girish. Thanks for the question. Like I said, just drop me a quick email or contact your account manager, and um, yeah, we can sort that out and we get it sent out. I think we're going to blanket send this out anyway to everyone that attended, so you should get it anyhow. Okay, well, um, with that, if there's nothing else, um, thanks again for your um, attending and your attention, and I hope you all have a good evening. <laughs>